us. Off the rank is Sam Kennard. We first heard from Sam in our third conference in 2001. Sam is the Managing Director of Kennard Self Storage. He was appointed in, as Managing Director in 1995 at the, uh, the ripe old age of 25 years old. Um, under his leadership, Kennard has grown into a business that now includes 67 locations, employs 200 people in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I think the thing that distinguishes Sam's story is the utter commitment to culture being an important part of his business performance and his business's success. <laughs> and I think um, he probably takes out a record for having done a culture audit using the organisational culture inventory, the OCI, every year since 1998. So he's going to share that story. So ladies and gentlemen, would you please uh, warmly welcome Sam Kenner back to the stage. I had to figure out a way to compress them. At the end of the day, I thought, well, that's way too conventional. So I've got six. So, um, you know, I think I'm entitled. <laughs> um, just a little bit about us. Um, we're a family business. Uh, we began our storage business in 1973. My grandfather started the hire company, but now Kennard's Hire and Kennard Self Storage are completely separate businesses as of 1991. Um, my dad and I own the storage company, and my uncle owns the hire company just to get that clear. Um, <laughs> I took over in 95, as Quentin said, I was 25 years old, we had 14 locations. And I did our first uh, culture survey in, in 1998. I'll just come back to that in a little bit, but I would like to touch on um, an event that occurred in 2004 when we bought uh, our competitor, Miller's Self Storage, a very big in Sydney here too. Um, that was a, um, a, massive, a massive deal for us, it was a $220 million acquisition. Uh, we spent uh, over a million dollars on due diligence with stamp duty lawyers, um, corporate lawyers, financial like um, mortgage <coughs> lawyers. We had DD on environmental, on geotech. We had things. We knew the properties and we knew the entities intimately. Um, and I went along to uh, the um, chairman at the time, the chairman of the fund, and I said, "Could I do an audit on the culture of the of Mills?" There was no way he wasn't going to let me do that. So I didn't get the opportunity to learn about what I was getting myself into. Um, I, we had a fair idea of what it was going to be like, um, but um, it would have been nice to actually know exactly what we were, we were biting off. Um, so I'll just put a graph up, which is the 10 years again, that shows the changes in our culture between 2004 and 2005, highlighted. What actually happened when we bought Miller's, and we tried to capture it as a, a merger, an integration, Nice words like that. And the reality was we had a collision between the two organisations. <laughs> Their head office had 24 people in it to run the same number of properties that we had. We had 12 people. It just sort of illustrates the command and control structure that they had. Um, you know, the guys on the sites did not make any, many decisions. The language in the properties about us was very hostile. Um, they did not, that, we were their worst enemy, you know, they were taught and trained not to like Kennard. So when we came in and said, yeah, we're here, we're okay, um, you know, it was pretty tough. Um, you can see in 2004 the culture was extremely constructive, very boring. And it's, um, you know, I think it's important, it gave me a lot of strength to know that we could do this deal and, and integrate the businesses knowing the culture that we had um, at that time. It's all very well for a CEO to run around um, with a lot of ego and, you know, swearing buying properties and you know, growing a business, but there's a lot of people who have to do a lot of work around all that. So I, I had a lot of um, faith that we had the, um, the, the appetite to do this in my, in my team. In 2005, we did the survey again, and we knew it was going to deteriorate, but 
the 2005 survey allowed us to really take a snapshot of the things that we had yet to do and the things that probably some of the mistakes that we've made and we could have taken away and learned from. So you can see it deteriorated um, in the, um, the red and green there, the impact of doubling the size of your business and a lot of um, hostility. But the blue is still quite resilient, so we were quite pleased that that stayed quite resilient at that time. Today, um, we've got 67 locations. Our teams are really small, they're two to four people. Um, they're spread across you know, uh, two countries, um, most of Australia, and um, communication. It's not like we can pull people into a room and have a big um, you know, motivational session. We, our communication challenges are different. Um, we're still privately owned. Uh, our assets are um, worth about $800 million Australian, and um, we, our, our business pursuit has become a famous last household brand like um, <coughs> Vegemite, uh, Holden, VV, or Steinlager now in New Zealand. Um, so that's our pursuit. And the, and the thing about culture for us is that customer service is essential to that, employee engagement, and the culture is the glue that holds that together. Back in 1997, 98, when we started, um, our staff turnover was really high. Um, we had a lot of gossip and whinging, they had the infighting. Um, we had, I, wrong, I promoted the wrong people into senior roles. And they were good people, but just doing, they just weren't capable of the roles that was what I was asking of them. And for quite some time, I was in some denial about the problems in the business until the meltdown sort of got quite, quite serious. And we had good people leaving. So in 1998, we ended up doing a survey. Um, and that was the, the wake up call for me. And I decided to refresh and replenish the, um, the, the senior team. Um, as I said, respecting that they were good people doing the best that they could, they were just not going to be able to do, or they had to commit to coming on the journey of change. That's what I asked them to do. In the end, um, they either stepped down or left the business. So it was quite a renewal for us. Um, and for me, culture at that time, all I've been shown this model, it, it, it didn't really make sense to me. And then when I did this, it really resonated as a concept. And the thing that the OCI did was it gave, it gave it a language and made it tangible. It, it's sort of something I could latch onto and, and understand. So that, that was the beginning of what we did. So um, what did we learn? Firstly, um, we hire for culture, fit and values. We do that first in our leadership and then we do it through the rest of the business without exception. Uh, I, I can teach people about storage and we can teach people about leadership, but I'm not, we're not really prepared to go and try and change people's values. Um, we try to create a safe, uh, an environment that, um, through being authentic and genuine, to create a safe environment where people can make mistakes, they can be themselves, they can feel vulnerable, they can talk openly and make mistakes. And, uh, and I started that firstly in 1998-99 by reflecting on the times before that about the mistakes that I'd made um, and sort of set an example in that way, in that time, and, and that continues today. Um, we do warts and all communication through the business. Um, we admit our mistakes and we, we avoid as much as possible to make excuses, um, to put spin and gloss onto what we're doing, you know, our mistakes, are, you know. So we, we try to be quite candid in everything we do. And we talk about intentions and perceptions with people. We sort of allow people to not um, avoid the judgment of, ju uh, of judging people too quickly about their behaviour. If someone's come out with a bit of an aggressive comment or behaviour, you know, their intentions, 99% of the time, were, were terrific. It's just the way they've done it. So they need some help in their execution. 